as Ori points out, some of the, the most painful times in our lives are those times that, uh, or we feel that really strong sense of separation. You've probably experienced that before. I certainly appreciate Ori talking about that from his own experience. That, that grief that we feel when we lose a loved one, that is, is the most extreme form of that separation that we experience on, on this side of life. But you know, it's, it's more than that. As you think about it, it, it there, there are other times when that real sense of, of separation from someone causes a, a great deal of pain for us. We hurt whenever a friend takes a new job, don't we? And they have to move to another place, and we know that, that we're not going to see them as often. And even though we have technology and we can stay in touch on the phone and text messaging, you know, and all these things, we also know it's just not the same when we're separated by all of those, all of those miles. Even a good thing, like your children going off to college, that could bring a really strong sense of separation for, for both parent and child alike. That's, that's kind of where we've been living the last six months or so. So we understand, you know, what that's like. And I think there's a, there's a unique sort of pain that comes when we experience that, that sense of estrangement, especially in a family. You know, it's just really heartbreaking when you hear about about the stories of, of parents and children who, for whatever reason, are, are estranged from one another, or, or husbands and wives, or just whatever the family dynamic might be, that is a unique kind of pain all of its own. So you probably know what some of that is like. Unfortunately, we all understand that pain that comes from separation, but I don't bring any of that up today to make you feel sad about that. I, I, I hope that, that you understand that. The, the thing that I want to do, even in saying all of that, is to use that as a real contrast point to the message that we hear in God's Word that I really want us to focus on today, and that is the message of Jesus being Emmanuel. He is God with us, and that's what we'll focus on here together over the next few minutes. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to open up with me to Matthew chapter 1, and we'll begin by looking at this passage here this morning in Matthew 1. This is a passage that we, we looked at a couple of weeks ago when we started this Knowing Jesus series, and we, we just read a part of it, but we kind of held back to, to add this piece for today, because at the, at the beginning of this passage, it's talking about the birth of Jesus, and, and we looked at it specifically because it tells us about him being named Jesus and what that name even means, okay? But today we'll see here that the, the gospel writer, Matthew, he gives us not only insight into what the name Jesus means, but another name, and that's this name, Emmanuel. So if you're in Matthew's gospel, we'll look here uh, in Matthew 1. We'll begin in verse 18 and read down to verse 23 together. I have these words on the screen. Feel free to follow along uh, in your own copy of, of God's word as well. This is, this is God's word. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly, it says. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is, again, from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's where we stopped a couple of weeks ago. We pointed out the name Jesus really means Savior. It means that God saves, okay? But then you go to the next, the next set of verses here, and it says this, and this is where we really want to focus today. All this took place, it says, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, and then Matthew records for us a prophecy from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, and then we get this note, which means God with us. So again, we, we looked at this several weeks ago, but we didn't look at this final part, and that's where we, we'll, we'll dig in here together today. What does it mean for Jesus to be Emmanuel? What does it mean for him to be God with us? We've already been singing those words. We've reflected on that as, as Matt led us in that call to worship a moment ago. 
We've been reflecting on that even as we were gathered around the table together. Jesus, God with us, what does that mean? Well, Matthew here, as he talks about the, the birth of Jesus, he, he kind of makes one point that I think is, is worth beginning with here this morning, uh, that it's, it's about the, the birth of Jesus being unique and singular. He's born of a virgin. Uh, as Matthew says here, he goes back to Isaiah chapter 7, and, and, and he sees what's happening here in the birth of Jesus. As Matthew is recording this, the Holy Spirit inspires him to, to, to see and to understand, to realize that the birth of Jesus is the fulfillment of a prophecy that, that's 700 years old. So approximately 700 years before the birth of Jesus, give, give or take, okay, Isaiah has this prediction. God puts this on his heart. He prophesies that a virgin will conceive, she will give birth to a son, and that child will be known as Emmanuel. So his birth will be a signal to the people, a sign, if you will, okay? And it's a symbol, it's a sign that God hasn't forgotten his people, that God, in a very real way, in the birth of this child, Isaiah says, God is going to be with his people, okay? He's going to be with his people in the birth of this child in a way unlike anything before, so there is something really singular and unique about the birth of Jesus. And again, Isaiah makes this prediction 700 years before it happens, okay? That is a long time. <laughs> that, is, that is far uh, uh, older than, than even our nation that, that, that we, you know, we live in here today. That would be kind of like uh, Leonardo da Vinci's great-grandfather uh, great predicting uh, 700 years ago, the winner of the Super Bowl tonight, okay? Just to give you some sort of like perspective of, of the distance between Isaiah's day and the birth of Jesus. This is a long time. It is only by the power of God that Isaiah is able to make that kind of long-range prophecy, that kind of prediction, okay? And so Matthew, after, after experiencing, you know, the, the life, the death of Jesus, he is writing this gospel down, and he says that this prophecy is fulfilled in the virgin birth of Jesus. And his unique birth is just another one of those symbols. It's a parallel to his unique death. He is born of a virgin that is definitely unique, and his death his once and for all death, and with dying on the cross for the sins of the world, that is certainly a unique sort of death as well. So everything about Jesus is unique from start to finish. And so in addition to all of this, this unique birth, not only is it parallel this unique death, but this unique birth is also a message to us, a message to anyone who would put their faith in Jesus, that in Jesus God is with us. He's with his people. You think about that word with. It's a really small little word, isn't it? But it's also one of those words that has life-changing power. The word with. It simply means to be accompanied by someone. And there's real power in that. There's real power in knowing that we're not alone, in knowing that we do have someone who journeys alongside of us, someone who comes along and, and joins us either in our pain or in our great joys. Sometimes that can be enough to change your life. Just knowing that you're not alone, knowing that you have someone who is with you. It's probably been a long time for some of us, but do you remember what it was like to be the new kid at school? Or maybe that, that first day of work, you know, you, you're kind of like the, the, the newbie, and, and that's all well and good, you know. Normally, you, you show up at school, you go to your first class, or you show up at work, they at least show you where your cubicle is or your office or whatever. But the time that is the most stressful when you're new, you know what it is? Lunchtime. Because that, well, who do I sit with and where do I go and how does all this work? If you, you remember what that's like when you're the new person. And so to have someone in that scenario who invites you into their group, hey, come sit with us, you know? Avoid the meatloaf. It's really not good. You know, like somebody who can just like give you a little bit of that, that insider info but also invite you into their group, man, that is, that is huge to know that you have someone who's with you. Or how about when you're grieving, 
you know, it's just, it's just the worst of moments. And your best friend drives all the way through the night. You know, she, she books a flight immediately and she shows up at your door just so, so she can hold your hand, just so she can be there with you so you know you're not alone. Or even in, in the good times when, you know, you gather with your friends, your family to celebrate something, maybe it's a holiday, maybe it's a birthday or an anniversary, and you know in that moment when y'all are together, you know, like, I'm with my people, you know? There's real power in that word, with. And those are the moments that, that are really powerful because someone chooses, that's the big thing here, they've, they've made a choice to be with you. When my, my children were much younger, they would do the same thing that every child would do. Whenever they had to go do something that they didn't want to do or maybe it was a little bit scary, you know, I've got to, got to like go, I don't know, do something that they, they just were a little bit afraid of doing. The question was always, Daddy, will you go with me? And even as we get older, that, that fear of being alone, I don't think it ever really goes away. And we certainly benefit from just the knowledge of knowing that we're not alone, that someone's with us. So I think it's only natural then that we would bring all of this into our relationship with our God. You know, you can hear this if you listen to, to the way that we pray. You can hear that th this is really at the heart of what we want in our relationship with God. When, when we pray, when we come together, how many times do we ask God, please be with so-and-so, please be with, you know, my family, or please be with this person in the church who we know is, is, is sick or grieving or struggling or, you know, be with them. Well, we say that so, so often because it, there's no better way to say what's in our hearts for people, for ourselves, when it comes to our relationship with God. I, I think I've prayed that same prayer at every funeral that I've done over the last 20, 25 years. God, please be with this family in their time of grief. But again, it's not just the bad times. I think in, in the same vein, I've, I've prayed a version of that, that same prayer at every wedding over which I've presided. God, please be with this couple and, and, and this, this new family that begins right here today. Whether it's, it's grief or joy, the most comforting thought that we have, one of the most comforting things we can imagine is God being with us. And so in Jesus, this is what, this is, what is really important, in Jesus, God is saying, I'm right here. I'm with you. The most repeated promise in the Bible is I will be with you. The most repeated promise. God, God must love saying this because he says it all the time. I mean, you just go anywhere you want in God's word and you start reading. It won't take you long before you come across these words from God. He'll say, I am with you. It's, it's sort of like, you know, if, if you just were reading the Bible and you didn't know anything about humanity or, or, or even God or whatever, like you would walk away thinking, okay, there must be this, this universal desire for us as humans to know that we're not alone, and, and God also must have this overwhelming desire to let us know that he will always be with his people, because he says it to us all the time. When God spoke to Moses out of that burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, okay, he told Moses, I want you to go back to, uh, to Egypt, I want you to confront Pharaoh, I want you to get my people, and I want you to bring them home, okay, but go back to Egypt. That was like step one in that whole deal. And that was the place of Moses' greatest moral failure, okay? So imagine like your greatest mistake, the place where, you know, your, your shame is, is just... At, at its peak, the place of your greatest regret, you know, whatever it might be, God's showing up and telling you, hey, I want you to go back to that place. I want you to just get right back there in the thick of all of that. Well, Moses resists, kind of like you and I would probably resist if God, you know, said that to us. Um, he says, I want you to go back there, Moses. I have work for you to do. And Moses balks at this idea. He says, who am I? Who am I to go talk to Pharaoh, you know? I'm nobody. I'm a shepherd. I'm just out here in the middle. And on top of that, I'm a wanted man back there. 
Okay, if I, if I could go, I'll, I'll remind you, Lord, I murdered someone and I had to flee as a fugitive from Egypt. So if I go back there, I may never get out of there alive, you know. This is what Moses says to God. But what God says in reply to Moses there, Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, he says to Moses, I will be with you. He says, you know, don't worry. I'm with you. I've got this. You just follow me, and I'll take care of the rest. God's presence, his withness, if we can invent a word, <laughs> you know, his presence, his with, you know, being with Moses, he says, that's going to be enough. If I'm with you, that's great enough to overcome your past, your failures, your mistakes, all that shame, all that regret that you've got. He says to Moses, basically, I'm with you. I know all about that past. You know, do you think I picked you because I thought you were like spotless? Or that, you, that you were like some perfect ambassador? Like God's saying to Moses, I know all about your hangups and your issues and your shame and your mistakes. And he says the same thing to us. He knows all about that thing that you hope nobody ever finds out about. He knows all about those things that keep us up at night. The great regrets and the shame and the guilt, all those things that weigh so heavily on us. And yet he still says to us, just like he says to Moses, I'm with you. And then you know, he says the same thing to, to Moses' successor, to Joshua. You just roll the clock forward here, and it's the same deal. You know, second verse. So Joshua's standing on the brink of the promised land. He's about to enter into this place where he's never been before. And he's going to be going up against new enemies. He's going to be facing new challenges. Oh, and by the way, he's going to be doing all of this without Moses, who's been leading the people for all of these years. That is a lot of change. That's a lot of transition. And Joshua responds to all that change and all that transition, kind of the way you and I do a lot of times. He's afraid. He's fearful. Because we don't like change. We don't like things the way they are, but we also don't like change. You know, like that's just funny how, how we are. But when, when change comes, man, we get really, we get really fearful. We get kind of locked up. And Moses is, uh, Joshua's standing on the brink of the promised land, and God's saying, hey, I want you to just set foot wherever you put your foot. I'm going to give you this land. Okay? Oh, but I'm afraid, Lord. You know, these people are huge. These giants are in the land. There's new enemies, and I don't understand. So he says to Joshua three or four times there at the beginning of Joshua 1, be strong and courageous and never afraid, for I am with you. All you have to do is walk. And it's this, God is saying, like, his powerful presence is enough to, to, to overcome that, that narrative of negativity that is just on repeat in Joshua's mind. I'll be with you. You'll be okay. And, and, and it goes on and on from there, you know? That's just two examples in God's Word of, of how, you know, the people and the, and the places may change, but God's promise remains steadfast when he says, I will be with you. And in Jesus, God is saying, once and for all, I'm with you. It's like Moses. A lot of us are crippled by, by shame. Again, we have those mistakes in our past that haunt us. We have those feelings of, of regret uh, and guilt that weigh so heavily upon us, so much so that we, like Moses, kind of say to ourselves, you know, I'm nothing I'm a nobody, I'm worthless, but God's response to all of that, when we do that, it's the same way, same thing that he says to Moses. He offers the power of his presence, because he knows, God knows how transformative that can be. Like we said, sometimes just the knowledge of knowing you're not alone, having someone who is with you is enough to change your life. And just like Joshua, a lot of us today, we're facing challenges. I don't know what those might be for you. I can, I can guess, you know, maybe you're spread, you know, thin at work, maybe you're dealing with some sort of personal issue, problems in your family, those, those tend to be, you know, some of the main ones, okay? Um, but that's right where God shows up in Joshua's story and in our story as well. He shows up and he says, I'll be with you wherever you go. The sun is shining or the dark clouds are forming, it doesn't change the fact that I am who I said I would be and I'm where I said I would be, I will always be with you. And again, God must love saying that. He must really love saying that because he says it all the time. 
The picture of Jesus as God with us is also a really strong counter to some of the, some of the false understandings that we sometimes have of God, some of the misunderstandings that we sometimes have about who God is. I just want to point out a couple of these because I think it's helpful, gives us a good contrast point again with this truth about Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us. The idea that, that Jesus is Emmanuel, it really does help counter this first view that God doesn't care about me. A lot of us live with that. You're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm so insignificant. I'm so small. My problems are so small. God just probably overlooks me. God probably ignores me. You know, our, our world is home to over 8 billion people. It's a lot of people. 8 billion people. And in light of that, some people have adopted this view that, that God is somehow like really detached from us because there are 8 billion of us, that, that he is um, far removed from our lives. And so people will think, you know, how can he possibly care for me? I'm just one of 8 billion other people here on the planet. But that really comes from a skewed understanding of humility. It's like thinking too lowly of yourself and not thinking highly enough of God, if that makes sense. Because when we do that, we, we sort of like belittle ourselves. We say, like, oh, I'm, so, I'm so insignificant, I'm nothing, I'm just small. How could God even care about a, you know, a, a, a little nothing like me? We're disparaging the very creation that God said, number one, bears his image, but also the, the creation for which he sent his son to die. You see that? And like, and if, and so if God has made this judgment that he has deemed you worthy, Right? Like, worthy at least of, of the death of his son. If so if he has deemed you as worthy, I mean, not, not to, I'm not trying to be ugly to you, but like, who are you to come along and undermine his judgment? Does that make sense? <laughs> like, like, if he has said, you're worthy of my son's blood, that's how much you matter, okay? Like, you matter to God that much. Then, Man, who, who am I to come along and say, like, God doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm really insignificant. I'm so small. I'm so no. He couldn't possibly care about me. Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us, is a counter to that, right? It's a counter to that. Because when he promises to send Jesus to be with us, he does it because, because he cares. So that's one of these that Emmanuel kind of counters. Another one is this, is that, that God... Not that God doesn't care, but on this one, God is against me. This is this view that God, like, opposes me, that God is, is, is always seeking to punish me, you know? Uh, it's a picture of God as, as the, the cosmic enforcer, you know? That he is just waiting for me to step out of line so he can just throttle me. So he, he can zap me, you know, with, with into oblivion, you know, that he can just, just nuke me for my uh, mistakes. And that comes from the skewed view of God's judgment. And, and that's worthy of a whole conversation. In a couple weeks, Lord willing, we'll talk about that because that is, a, that is language that you hear referring to Jesus. So, so everything that we're saying right now is just like a placeholder. We'll come back, we'll unpack all of it, Lord willing, again. Okay, so, so the question is, uh, will we be judged for, um, uh, by God in the end? Uh, the Bible affirms that. So there is this judgment, okay? So you, no, no getting around that. Uh, there is this day of judgment awaiting us, and it would behoove us to, you know, consider that. Okay, but you've got to lay that alongside the, the idea of Jesus coming being good news because, because Jesus comes in order to save us. This is, this is the whole point, okay? He comes in order to save us from that condemnation. Save us from the condemnation that comes from judgment because of our mistakes and our sins and our failures and, and all those things. In, in 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul speaks of Jesus and he refers to him as the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. And that's, that's where it's, it's good news that Jesus is Emmanuel. I think it's actually good news for us that Jesus is also the judge of the living and the dead. So we'll talk about that in a couple weeks again, Lord willing, all right? But for today, it's good news 
that he comes to be with us because his purpose and his intent, he doesn't come to be with us because he's somehow against us. He doesn't come to be with us because he just wants to point out all your flaws. You know, when Jesus walked this earth, you know, the people who were drawn to him the most, it seems, were those people who were well aware of their mistakes and their sins and their failures. And Jesus would always call them to be a better version. He would always call them to be a transformed version, the person God intended for them to be, okay? But he also had this ability to walk with sinners without making them feel judged because they were sinners. I, I, I wish we like, could just see him in action. I would love to see, I, I just know how he does that with me. So yes, we, we fear his judgment, but it's not only that judgment. That is not the only way we come to know God. We come to know God as, as Emmanuel, Jesus. He is God with us because he's for us. And if God, Romans 8, if God is for us, do you remember the last, then who could possibly be against us? He's not against us. And in, in, in this, this picture of Jesus as Emmanuel, we see just how much he is for us. And then lastly, this, this misunderstanding is pretty common, maybe the most common one of all. This idea that God has forsaken me, this idea that because of the circumstances in my life, God has somehow abandoned me, that God is, is somehow not trustworthy, and that usually comes from a skewed view of our own pain. When, when someone holds that, that view, it's usually because they have this skewed, you know, outsized understanding of their own pain. I know in my own life, when I've landed here, it's because of that. Um, our pain is like all we can see. So, so we turn to God and then we end up kind of blaming him for everything. Uh, sometimes that comes about because someone else has hurt us. And so what we do is we just sort of transfer that up onto God. We start to say like, well, nobody can be trusted because this person I was close to and they hurt me. And so th therefore God must be this way too. And, and, and so we assume that, that he'll do this to us, that he'll forsake us, that he'll abandon us, all that just because of our pain. And it's not true. That's not who God is. Now, God will let you hurt sometimes. This is not a popular view. We don't like to hear this, but the Bible kind of points. God, God will let you hurt sometimes. Uh, hey, we don't just like snap our fingers and tell God what to do and tell him to take away the pain, take away the boot. Like, that's not the way it works. God will let you hurt sometimes. But here, here's the beautiful thing, Okay. He'll never harm you. God will let you hurt sometimes, but he will not harm because it's not in his nature. Well, why does he let us hurt sometimes? I don't know. He doesn't answer to me. But here's what I've learned. Sometimes God will let us hurt a little uh, because he has redemptive purposes for that pain. He's trying to let the pain do something. So he lets it happen for a, a little while. This is very biblical. You see it in James. You see it in 1 Peter. You see it all in Job. He lets the pain sit there for a little bit because he's, he's trying to let the pain do something. You know? Does that make sense? Pain is a great catalyst for change. Talk to a doctor. <laughs> They'll tell you. Man, about the only way I can get people to do what they're supposed to do is they have to hurt enough. You know, it's just like part of the way we're, we're kind of wired, you know? So pain is a great catalyst for change. It's one of the only things that changes anything at all, prayer and pain. That's about all I know that changes anything in this world. So sometimes God will let that pain linger. He'll let it hurt for a minute. And sometimes that's when we throw up our hands and we're like, God, you've forsaken me. Where are you? You abandoned me. Because this hurts. I get it. I've done that. I've said that. I've felt that. I get it, Okay. But God will let it hurt for a period of time. But he will never, ever harm us. We, when we are walking with God, we are safe. Doesn't mean nothing bad will ever, ever happen to us. I had to grow out of that view that I inherited somehow in my church growing up. It does mean, though, we're safe. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, those who trust in the Lord are safe. If you walk with him, if he is Emmanuel to you, if he is God with us, then you're safe with him. 
It, it might hurt every now and then, but that does not mean he's forsaken you. It means that he might have other purposes for that pain. But you can trust that you're safe. Jesus as Emmanuel is evidence of God's great faithfulness because all of his promises come to fruition here in Jesus. He's light, in him there is no darkness. The story of the Bible is God's great faithfulness to us throughout the ages. And Jesus is the ultimate sign of that faithfulness. And all three of these views of God are proven to be false whenever we see Jesus in this light as Emmanuel as evidence that God is indeed with us. I'm going to close by saying this. You know the first verse of the Bible? A lot of people know this one. You probably recite it from memory. Genesis 1, 1. I'll get you started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a foundational statement, right? Of the whole Bible, everything that follows is built on that view of God as the creator. Okay, first verse of the Bible. Do you know the last verse of the Bible? That one doesn't, like, come to mind you know, quite as, as readily for uh, a, a lot of us. And that's really kind of a shame because the last verse contains this foundational truth as well. Uh, here it is. I'll try to beat you to it before you turn there. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Would you read that with me and say it again? Let's go. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The Bible begins with this epic scene. God is speaking the heavens and the earth into existence, and it's just happening. It's huge, and it's, it's wide angle. you got the creation of the sun, moon, stars, all that, life on earth. But the Bible closes with this, this simple promise, these simple words of hope. May the grace of Jesus be with his people. And the entire gospel is bound up in that little word, with. That word carries all of our hopes and all of our dreams, our deepest desires to be with God someday. And Jesus has come to be with us, to give us what we need more than anything else. And that is the grace that leads to eternal life. It's as if God wants to say this one more time before we close our Bibles. I'm with you. If my son is with you, then my grace is with you. And God promises to be with those who put their trust in him. So today, are you in need of his grace? Are you in need of his presence? Maybe you have everything you ever wanted, and yet it seems like something is still missing. Can I just say, that's because you were made for more than what this life can truly offer. You were made for eternal union and communion with God. And your soul, as Augustine says, remains restless until it finds rest in Him. And so His grace is extended today to any who would respond in faith. Would you receive the Lord Jesus today in baptism? Would you confess Him as both Lord and Savior today, would you confess him as Emmanuel? He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. May his grace be with us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord who makes all things new, he who has ears, let him hear. Let's stand now and sing together.